All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us in the room. Thank you to those online um, who are joining us. You, okay, Bertrand, you have a... Right it's right here. <laughs> Don't leave the luggage unattended. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Um, welcome, welcome to our workshop um, to uh, address what is a very topical um, issue, uh, and it's to do with law enforcement um, access to user data in the context of criminal investigation. My name is Alexandre Roux. I'm with the Computer and Communications Industry Association. Uh, CCIA um, is co-host of this panel. Um, our second co-host um, is the Council of Europe and Alexander Seger. Um, uh, we are delighted to have Alexander Seger with us uh, as co-host, but also as speaker and present some of the views, um, some of the developments happening in the Council of Europe. Um, I'll be your moderator. Um, we 
uh, for the uh, for, for for the purpose of this workshop, um, Rachel Stelly, um, my colleague from from our DC office, will be the online moderator, and will take questions from the online audience um, when we move on to the Q and A session. Um, we, you know, CCA and the Council of Europe. Uh, that's not the first time that we are ho co-hosting a panel on this very issue. We did one in Mexico. We did another one in Geneva two years ago. There was a bit of a gap last year in Paris, but now we are back, and we thought it was time to catch up. I think since that time, a lot has happened. Uh, we've seen the U.S. moving forward with uh, legislation on to reform. Uh, law enforcement access to data. The EU, is, the European Union is also doing the same. Uh, the Council of Europe is now has been discussing for about two years now um, a framework um, for uh, to, to deal specifically with that issue and adding a second protocol to the Cybercrime Convention. Uh, I think we'll touch on many of these issues. There are other developments out there. Um, I want to... Uh, first introduce the panel um, and maybe set the scene very briefly just to let you know we'll have first five minutes for each speaker to present their um, their brief introductory remarks after that we'll move on to a discussion among panelists and then we'll then open um, the discussion uh, to all of you in the room and to do on to those online as well um, so, um, first of all, uh, we, as a first speaker, we have uh, Fernanda Dominguez. Um, she is the uh, federal uh, prosecutor in the cybercrime units um, of the Brazilian Prosecution Service. So she'll offer her perspective from the law enforcement uh, community on how data has become so important and how Brazil, among other countries, perhaps is reforming its rules to empower um, uh, the law enforcement authority uh, to to get easier access data and to conduct uh, uh, its job thoroughly. Um, then we'll hear the perspective of um, uh, the business uh, community. Uh, Ludmila Georgieva is um, a uh, policy, public policy manager at um, Google in the Brussels office. Uh, her job is uh, to do um, with is she basically she's very much hands on on European discussions around law enforcement uh, access to data, um, but as well as transatlantic developments as and international developments as well. Um, next up will be Jennifer Daskal. Um, and Jennifer Daskal is a professor, uh, I'm sure most of you know her, she's a professor at the American uh, University of Washington, um, and she is the uh, leading the program on um, uh, tech, uh, law, and security. Is that correct? Is that the name of the program, Jennifer? Okay, sorry, thank you. Um, We'll hear as well from uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle, um, who is the uh, co-founder and executive director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Um, the network is, has been doing a lot of work for some time in trying to engage with a multitude of stakeholders um, to try and design a common uh, well to, to come to a common understanding of the problems and comes to um, to accompany sort of like the, the uh, legal and policy discussions in other fora as well, precisely on that issue. Um, and uh, finally, we'll hear from Alexander Seger with the Council of Europe. Alexander is the head of the cybercrime division um, in the Council of Europe, and as such, he leads the discussion um, on the revision, on the, on the drafting of a second protocol to the Budapest Convention. Uh, to the cybercrime convention. I think just very, just two words before we move on to the discussion, um, to the presentation of the speakers. Um, clearly, we've seen, of, you know, over the past few years, a number of countries that are reforming their laws to better equip the law enforcement community um, in trying to access data in criminal investigations. Um, what we are witnessing are oftentimes unilateral assertions 
um, through national legislation. But these, are, these have oftentimes implications for foreign countries, for the residents of those countries, and that includes, among other, th other things, their privacy rights uh, and the protection afforded by third country legislation. We look into that um, with all of our speakers. Um, one thing I should add that naturally, uh, you know, there are also implications for the business community, for those online service providers that are used by everyone in this room, as well as potential criminal suspects, but also innocent, um, innocent people. Um, and the business community is really very much the custodian of um, of user data, so it falls. It we'll explore with uh, the um, uh, with the panel um, the, the room for maneuver, the, the and the extent of the company's uh, responsibility and liability uh, when it come, when they receive uh, law enforcement data access. As we see more and more reforms across the world um, to um, to better equip the law enforcement community. I think I'll stop here. And Fernanda, please. Um, if you could just five minutes of introductory remarks, that'd be fantastic. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Very honored to be here in this distinguished table. Well, uh, from a law enforcement perspective, uh, nowadays I can say that almost every crime needs digital evidence, not only crimes committed via internet or via computer systems. If we come across a homicide besides the crime scene, we go for the cell phone, for the computer data, for the victim services on the cloud, for Alexa. <laughs> um, law enforcement primarily needs information about IP addresses, which allow knowing the origin of a connection to the internet. And it may point out to the author of a crime after the unfolding of more investigation. So the majority of investigations start with the IP addresses. Law enforcement also will use traffic data and content as evidence to go on further investigation and to support prosecution in court. In Brazil, we already have good legislation in force. It's our Marco Civil da Internet, Brazil Civil Rights Framework, uh, which was inspired on the Budapest Convention, and that gives law enforcement enough power to get data from the ISPs whose services are targeting our territory, as long as we have a domestic judicial order. By the way, it is in consonance with the EU evidence proposal. Considering safeguards, uh, a judicial order in Brazil is also required to get access to any kind of data, IP, traffic, or content. And also, as soon as the investigation becomes a criminal action, the defendant has access to all the evidence gathered, as well as the, to the chain of custody, being able to challenge the evidence in court and even plea for repair in a judicial redress action if he believes there has been any kind of abuse. Nonetheless, we still need to access data that is outside our jurisdiction, since more and more criminals are using the facilities of foreign internet services. The MLA's framework has to be improved because the way it is now, it is not at all suited for digital evidence uh, that can be moved and can disappear in instance. Um, I'd like to illustrate uh, that because we had a child abuse case on an internet forum where who is pointed to GoDaddy when it didn't have any office in Brazil or wasn't targeting Brazil. So we issued an MLA to US that took a year and 80 months to get an answer that we should ha have to issue another MLA to France where the owners of the forum wa was and another MLA to Netherlands, where the, the internet host was. That means that the child was to continue to be abused for more four years until we would get any hint about the location, and with little probability of the evidence to still be there. We also have problems with ISPs that refuse to comply with domestic judicial orders concerning, for instance, hate speech. In the last Olympics in Brazil, we had the first case subsumed to terrorism, which according to our law includes preparatory acts. We were lucky because due to other means, we got to know what the terrorist group was meaning to do. But two years before, we already had 
was investigating a Facebook profile where one of these men that were arrested was spreading hate speech and already recruiting for terrorism purposes. But we couldn't go on with the investigation because information about this profile was refused to us and was not to come even via MLA because it offends the US free speech amendment. That means that we wouldn't be able to give a law enforcement response according to the laws voted by a free elected Congress, putting at risk the people in my country because of a foreign legislation not accountable to the people of my country. Anyway, just to, to, to finish, in Brazil, we are very attentive to the discussions on EU evidence proposal and also eager to know about the second additional protocol to the Budapest Convention developments and the way these discussions will be, uh, will be able to help law enforcement to get access to data. We are still skeptical about the Cloud Act solution. Once it does not solve the hate speech crimes problems or the terrorism incitement problem, considering US law would only allow the disclosure of data in these cases if they met the Brandenburg case standards about imminence, what in general is too late for us. So I would finish saying that from a law enforcement perspective, it's rather frustrating not being able to act to sp stop ongoing crimes, nor to arrest or punish a criminal due to this mismatch among the actors related to cross-border digital evidence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Fernanda. Mm -hmm. um, Ludmila, um, may I turn my attention to you um, as a Google is a truly global uh, company is operating in multiple jurisdictions and facing with a slew of um, um, uh, access requests, judging from your transparency report. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the implications of what that means for you as, as, a, as a business um, and for, for your customers, your users? Thank you, Alexander, um, and uh, thank you for all for, for inviting us to be here. Um, it's a bit of always a tough uh, exercise to speak after law enforcement, uh, so uh, we will try to be a bit, uh, though, uh, solutions orientated. I think for us as Google, it's uh, what was always be important was um, that on the one hand, of course, the law enforcement cooperation to work with law enforcement, but also on the other hand, and this is extremely important for us, is to do fundamental rights safeguards in place uh, which are the balance between us. So for the, we, we receive, as you said, Alex, a, a lot of uh, requests, hundred thousand of requests worldwide. And that's why we are also in, in favor. We have internal policies, as you mentioned, the transparency reports and so on. We're trying to also to um, develop best practices for industry, how to approach um, all the different questions. But of course, a kind of a framework, an international framework is always helpful. And um, one of the reasons why we, the Cloud Act, we welcome the Cloud Act, we also welcome the European um, efforts for the e-evidence uh, proposal, uh, which Fernanda just mentioned, because it harmonizes. And the question is how you harmonize it. So I think there is like a balance between the different interests. and. We all want to serve and to prevent pedophile. We all want to prevent terrorism. But um, on the other hand, this can be also misused for other purposes. Because on the other hand, once you disclose the data, the data, the intrusion in the data subject rights has been already um, taken. Uh, so the point is where we always have to balance it. And that's why I think there is a lot of elements which, for us, uh, we see important the one of the the question of the jurisdiction that's what will be interesting to hear about the Council of Europe and the Budapest Convention. I think the question of notice um, notice of the user there is something under the u s Cloud Act that um, actually it is the authorities or the providers are obliged to notify the user unless there are other circumstances which the law enforcement have to explain. We have developed quite um, efficient tools of this user notification, and in the US there was also a huge debate on the question, should we use this or not? We think this is a very important safeguard for user fundamental rights, but also for law enforcement uh, for the future when um, there is any kind of a case afterwards. I think the question of um, sovereignty, so especially in the European Union, uh, the question of national security is always for uh, 
um, um, raised uh, when we are approached by one authority to disclose uh, data of, um, of citizens of another member state. Um, and I think this is a, the question when we exactly this kind of a user notification could also serve um, to safeguard the rights of users and of national authorities. The question of, um, I think the, the principle of necessity and proportionality is something very important. Of, of course, there are also the, all these extreme cases of terrorism and pedophile, and pedophile cases, but I think there is like this is a border where I think all society will agree that we all have, should work together, but these are not the only cases we're facing. So that's why I think the question of proportionality and necessity are very important, but also the uh, timelines to respond to certain uh, requests are important. We can, as a big company, of course, have a team in place that reviews everything, but also for smaller providers, you see the question how to respond and to deal with requests. Um, I think the, the question of um, harmonization, as I said at the beginning, is very important, but also the question of points of contacts. I think this is a system that uh, has worked very well when law enforcement uh, authorities have a point of contact that, uh, and this person is trained to deal with all these requests, trained to uh, work with the different providers, and this is something also a very efficient uh, model that we have experienced in different countries. And of course, the question of material scope, which has been raised, the differences between the countries. And we're in the middle of everything. So we're basically, we would like to have, so a very important issue is also how to prevent different, uh, the conflict of law between the different jurisdictions. So this is also an element that we are dealing with. And any kind of a legal solution, we are very grateful for that. So I will just make here a point and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you very much, Ludmila. Um, Jennifer, um, it seems that over the last few years, the concept of jurisdiction, I mean, clearly there's, I think there's an overall um, recognition that n perhaps um, the old system um, of mutual legal assistance um, may not be fit for purpose. And that's what we heard from Fernanda. Um, and we see more and more countries passing legislation we see uh, discussions in international fora, and clearly it feels like the concept of, um, of um, jurisdiction and territoriality are shifting. Can you tell us a little bit about that and your views on, the, on this topic? Sure, thank you, and thanks, thank, thank you for inviting me to be here and for all of you for, for coming and showing up. Um, so I think just to step back a little bit and, and put what we've been talking about in context, Obviously, we all know that with the growth of the internet, data moves across borders with rapidity. It's often mirrored and held in different places. When data transits, it's often broken up into small packets. And the location of data may be completely disconnected from um, the sovereign who is seeking, has an interest in that data for a host of reasons in ways that are very different than used to be the case with criminal investigations. So when we think about criminal investigations in an analog world, mostly um, law enforcement investigating local crime and local witnesses and local perpetrators and local victims is dealing with evidence that is held locally. Um, increasingly, evidence needed, sought in the investigation of specific crimes, including local crimes, involves some form of digital evidence. And oftentimes that digital evidence is held by providers that are located across international borders, or even if it's held by a locally based provider, the data itself is held in a place that's across international borders. And that raises all of the kinds of questions and challenges that, that we've been talking about today. And so there's an ongoing effort, and you can see this effort in a combination of the fact that the US passed the Cloud Act, which I'm more than happy to talk about in more depth, um, in the e-evidence discussions in the EU, in some of the discussions as part of the Budapest Convention, efforts by governments to try to sort this out and figure out how to tie their jurisdictional rules to their sovereign interests in a way that makes sense. And as we go forward and think about this, I think there's a few key points here. One is that obviously governments have a sovereign interest in preventing and investigating and prosecuting crime. 
Sovereigns also have a sovereign interest in protecting their citizens and residents and um, establishing the rules governing access to data of their citizens and residents in accordance with their normative values with regard to data protection um, and, and the relative balance of privacy and some of the free speech issues that were raised already. And so the goal here is to come up with rules that protect and serve those sovereign interests. And we need rules that are practical, that are effective, and they're enforceable. I think we've heard, and we, we will probably continue to hear about the ways in which the mutual legal assistance process is often not efficient and um, often um, takes extraordinary long times for um, the processing of, of data, even um, in situations where, um, again, one government is seeking access to data that's solely sought with the investigation of local crimes. And we need rules that ensure and promote civil liberties, privacy, and respect for the rule of law. Um, I'm happy to talk about how I think those map on to some of the various initiatives, but um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll wait for the next round. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, Bertrand, um, uh, the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network has, uh, for some years now, gathered stakeholders to try to come to solutions. Well, first of all, to agree on the problems, um, and then uh, to move on to, to solutions. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, and the work ahead um, for the network. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I will build actually on what has been said uh, before, and most of the message is contained in this slide. Um, we're in a situation where, yes, evidence is increasingly digital. Yes, it applies to all types of crimes. Yes, it is often stored somewhere else and requires cross-border uh, access. And in that context, both the governments and the private actors have developed ways to deal with how those requests for access to user information in criminal investigations are issued, transmitted, and handled. And they've done so both in the dimension of uh, regimes, rules of various sorts, but also technical systems for sending those requests, preparing those requests, dealing and handling them. And this is um, a context that calls fundamentally, and this is the one message that I want to share here, for the notion of interoperability. Because without that, we have the danger of seeing the proliferation of various initiatives with all the best intentions, <clears throat> that may actually create additional conflict of laws if they are not coordinated, and also make the system difficult to scale. Because we're talking about numbers that are increasing at an enormous speed. The estimations vary, but people are talking now about rates of growth of requests for about 40% a year, and this is going to be more and more needed, and we may have to handle millions of requests and ensure, as Jennifer mentioned, sufficient protections for this. And so the point that I want to highlight and the work that Internet and Jurisdiction as a policy network is helping the different actors to, to do is to see how this interoperability can be framed into a certain number of shared policy standards and how we can bring the different categories of actors together and we um, facilitate the, the work among um, more than 300 different entities and particularly in one contact group. Um, some of um, the members are actually on this table. Um, to identify norms, operational norms, criteria, and mechanisms to foster this interoperability. And the two dimensions to finish are the ones that I mentioned at the very beginning. One is interoperability between norms. How to ensure that there are as little as possible conflict of laws and that the principles and the mechanisms allow for the diversity of regimes and at the same time their coexistence. And the second dimension, which is often not addressed sufficiently because we naturally first work at the level of principles, the second dimension is how do the technical systems and how will the technical systems that both the governments, public authorities on the one hand, and the companies on the other hand are developing, how will they interoper interoperate? 
Particularly, a strong um, uh, issue is the formats for requests, how to make sure that they are um, interoperable a little bit like um, HTML, HTTP protocol or HTML protocol allowed web pages to be uh, understood irrespective of how they are structured. Likewise, the formats for requests potentially can be um, developed with a system of tags so that the systems for transmission can be jointly developed to be uh, working together. I don't get into details. Um, I encourage you two things, uh, to do two things. One, to go on our site to um, download the operational approaches that have been produced by the contact group we had last year in 2018-19, which propose a certain number of operational norms, criteria, and mechanisms for this. And the second thing is to invite you to come tomorrow to, uh, at 1.15 um, to the session that we have for INJ. Thank you very much, Bertrand. Um, now, um, let's turn our attention to the great work that the Council of Europe uh, has been doing so far um, over the past two years in trying to come to uh, legal uh, normative solutions um, for at least the signatory of the Budapest Convention. Um, Alexander Seger, if you could just tell us a little bit about uh, what it is that you've been uh, doing so far, and what's the latest development in coming up with a second protocol to the Budapest Convention? Thank you. Uh, as you said earlier, this is the third time that we do a workshop in a similar composition, uh, which some may find boring, but on the other hand, it also allows us to track progress over time, you know, so that we don't repeat the same things. And I'm happy to report that we have had some progress in this field since we did the first one in Guadalajara uh, some, some time ago. I'm talking about the work on the second additional protocol to the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime that is underway. In terms of context, and this helps us also when we talk about the threat of government access to data and so on, we have to keep in mind that for cybercrime, less than 1% is actually reported to the police, to criminal justice authority, and out of the 1% or less than 1% it is reported, less than 1% leads to uh, convictions, to a conclusive criminal justice outcome. So that leaves us with 0.01%, and believe me, that is a very optimistic scenario. It may be rather 0.001%. That's what we are talking about. That erodes trust in the rule of law, and what we also see, because criminal justice is not considered effective, powers shift to, to the national security arena, as we see in the field of terrorism. We talk here in the connection with the protocol to the Budapest Convention about a, a criminal justice approach, which means we talk about specific, specified data that may be needed in a specific criminal investigation. It has nothing to do with mass surveillance, with bulk uh, interception of data. It's specific data is needed in a specific criminal investigation. This is very important uh, to keep in mind, and the powers to obtain such data are based on law and have rule of law safeguards. Right? The Budapest Convention on Cybercrime is not a national security treaty. It's a criminal justice treaty that follows this logic. The work on the protocols, there were many, many years of pre uh, preparatory work, but then formally the negotiations started in September 2017 and hopefully will be concluded in a year from now. There are four blocks of uh, elements that are under consideration. The first one is to make mutual legal assistance more efficient. Nobody proposes, or hardly anybody proposes, to do away with the MLA system. The MLA system is there, it has proven to function in a good number of cases, it has protections built in, but we have to make it much more efficient, and there are a number of articles that are currently being prepared, or that have already been published, draft versions, on MLA, more efficient MLA. Secondly, we also need direct cooperation with providers in other jurisdictions. Google said already how many requests they receive. If the US Department of Justice has difficulties to deal with 25,000 requests on MLA in criminal matters, how could they add, deal with another 500,000 requests that are currently sent directly to service providers? The system would crash even more. 
We also need to think about situations where governments access data directly in other jurisdiction, the drug trafficker in the park situation, you're arresting a drug trafficker or a suspect on the streets here, the system is open, can you access the Gmail account? Because now you may search a server or a computer in another jurisdiction, that sort of situations. And if we can agree on that, where, where, where do we stop? Where is the limit where we say we cannot allow government hacking? I'm not sure that that provision will eventually fly, but we have indeed lots of unilateral solutions by different countries. And if we have such adventurous proposals, we have to make sure that we have strong data protection and uh, rule of law safeguards built in. You can find online, and we, we had last week uh, some uh, pub public hearings in Strasbourg during the Octopus Conference. We have a number of provisions that are public and draft versions. We have one on languages of requests, because that's a major obstacle for MLA. We have one on video conferencing, so that you don't have to fly witnesses and experts uh, back and forth. You can also have uh, hearings via video conference. We have emergency mutual assistance, which means we also need the 24-7 availability of MLA authorities. So they can also get access to data via MLA on a weekend in emergency situation. We have a provision on direct orders to service providers in other parties for the disclosure of subscriber information. Not any data, subscriber information uh, only. And then we have um, an article that has been published which talks about giving effect to orders from another party. That is government to government, but it reduces the heavy machinery of MLA to a, there are a few levels that are cut out, but the protections are still there. This is what currently is on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, this was very interesting indeed. Um, we'll, I think now we can proceed to sort of a discussion, formal discussion among the panelists. Um, I would start with uh, perhaps um, one thing that wasn't mentioned in the slides of Jennifer around the uh, ongoing uh, developments at international level or bilateral level to try and come to common solutions. Um, and that is efforts from at the UN level to come to um, um, a treaty, a UN level treaty on law enforcement access to data. Um, maybe uh, it's an open question to the, the panel. Um, I should we should specify that the resolution uh, was proposed um, by Russia, Syria, um, North Korea, and other countries. The resolution passed in the UN, I think, uh, last week. Um, but obviously, this is just this would just be the start of a very long process. Uh, all the legwork still needs to be done. Parallel to that, clearly, you have the Council of Europe, Europe doing uh, that have been doing already a lot of work in this space. Um, how do you envision this UN level efforts? Is the UN the right forum uh, for dealing with that specific issue? I don't know which one, who wants to take the question first? Um, okay, let Alexander? Me, let me start on, on this uh, complicated question. Uh, yes, the UN would be the right forum for a, an international treaty on cybercrime. It, it would have been the right forum 30 years ago when the, the, uh, the issue was discussed. I've been in the business for quite a while. 30 years ago, it was discussed in the connection with the United Nations Crime Congress in Cuba in 1990. And there was no consensus on a, a UN treaty on cybercrime. And the Council of Europe moved ahead and uh, had already started before and moved ahead. There is still no consensus today. If there were consensus today, yes, the UN should probably do that. But if there's no consensus, which, which is the case, it's counterproductive because it may lead in a further polarization of the world. And many of you may be aware of what happened in 2012 in Dubai with the international telecom regulations where the world is basically split. 91 countries are parties to that. 102 member states of the United Nations are not party to that. The world is split, and that will not move in either direction. And the same may happen if now, without a consensus, such work were to go ahead in, in New York. And there's another uh, concerning fact to that, that this is actually not really related to cooperation on cybercrime. 
or even electronic evidence. This is a, a purely foreign policy consideration. It has to do with, um, you know, who, who controls the internet and how do, how do states control the internet? And that's why so many oppose it, because they're saying we stand for a free and open internet. And this may yet be another step in the direction of, of state control over the internet. That's why, these are the sort of some of the concerns. That's why it has also been taken away from, from Vienna, where normally criminal justice matters are discussed in the United Nations, and usually by consensus. There's a long tradition, 40 years or 50 years of consensus decisions in Vienna on criminal justice matters. It has been taken to New York to take it into foreign policy, the diplomatic arena, uh, where uh, it's discussed then by, by diplomats. Can Thank I you. Go ahead, Fernand. A statement on this. Well, uh, well, Brazil has always supported the discussions in the arena of UN, but uh, last week when the proposal was launched, uh, Brazil has abstained from uh, from manifest uh, has, has abstained, and I cannot talk for the foreign affairs, but uh, from the perspective of the. Uh, prosecution service. We we've been supporting the uh, uh, the idea of joining the Budapest Convention because it's a, a framework, uh, a convention that already is there and is working. So we have present needs and we have to to attend it. We have to solve the problems that are already happening. So that's that's the our perspective. Bertrand, please go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think it might be uh, uh, useful for the, uh, the people in the room uh, to understand that the different regimes that are being discussed and that Jennifer had mentioned, uh, the Budapest Convention, the Digital Protocol, Cloud Act, and the uh, e-evidence regulation uh, in Europe, they have a sort of different architecture. The Cloud Act is something that is a series of its second part is based on a series of bilateral agreements. So it's a sort of hub and spoke system whereby the United States evaluates the legal regime or the legal system of a particular country and decides to lift under certain circumstances and conditions the blocking statute that prevents American companies from voluntarily disclosing information to a foreign uh, investigation. At the moment, there is one bilateral agreement that has been drafted and published by, uh, between the United Kingdom and the US. There was the announcement that uh, Australia is developing uh, an agreement as well, and there probably are going to be others. The European Union as a whole uh, is negotiating a, an agreement with the United States, although the European Union considers that it is not an agreement really under the Cloud Act, whereas the United States considers that it is an agreement under the Cloud Act. Nevertheless, this is an architecture that is one country that has the major position because of the location of the operators that would allow bilateral arrangements. The European Union e-evidence regulation that is currently in front of the European Parliament on a proposal by the European Commission revised by the Council, is a mechanism that establishes the capacity for European uh, Union law enforcement to issue binding orders to operators who provide services in the territory of the European Union. That being said, there might be situations where those binding orders would be in contradiction with the blocking statutes, such as the one that currently exists in the US, that would prevent the operators for complying with this order. So it's a different approach, which is not the country that has main operators granting access to a certain number of countries with sufficient standards in its view. It is a block of the European Union saying we should have the capacity to impose and issue a compelling order. The Budapest Convention, to, to go quickly, is on the basis of the actors who already participate in the um, uh, convention, which is more than 50, uh, 60 parties, and 
it is adding a layer, but what is interesting is that for each of those different things, there is the question of scalability. How does the regime grow afterwards, and how does it expand? And the Budapest Convention was an example of starting with a small number of actors and growing afterwards. To finish on the uh, question you asked regarding the, the UN, there's the whole question of, is the goal to have something that is universal in the end, or should we start with universal? And the problem of consensus that Alexander is, is raising is typically the problem at the moment because inside the UN, even if you start a negotiation, there is currently not sufficient agreement on what could be achieved. And even within the Budapest Convention negotiations, it is only on a certain number of issues that consensus begins to be achievable. So I think it's important in this discussion to understand the different dynamics between the four possible approaches and their uh, likelihood of success. Thank you. Alex Alexander, you wanted to add a, a word to that? Just one, just one point of, of where it stands in the UN. So this was a resolution brought in by seven, eight countries, Russia, China, North Korea, Venezuela, Belarus, Cambodia, I believe, and some others. And it was voted in the third committee of the General Assembly of the UN about two weeks ago. And it will now still have to go to the plenary of the UN General Assembly. So this is not yet done. So some governments may still say we support it or not support it, whatever. So the final vote in the General Assembly will only be in, in mid-December. And if it goes through, then it would establish a committee to negotiate a new, a new convention in, in New York from next year onwards. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps uh, we can uh, focus a little bit of our attention to uh, something that's been talked about, um, uh, um, that's been talked about a lot uh, lately, which is the, the US Cloud Act as such. Um, Jennifer, you've written extensively about the US Cloud Act, what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, there's probably maybe a lot of misconceptions about what this what is national legislation, what it brings forward, what are the advantages, the pros and cons of this legislation. Can you uh, shed some light on that, please? Sure, thank you. So um, as probably all of you know, the Cloud Act has two very distinct parts. Um, they're interconnected, obviously. They're both dealing with data, access to data across borders, but they're very different. Um, and we've talked a little bit about the second part already, that is the response of the US government to the kinds of frustrations that we heard um, from Brazil about foreign governments seeking access to data that's held by US-based service providers, and even in the investigation of local crime according to local rules, and being told by the service providers that they can't disclose at least the communications content, meaning the substance of emails or iMessages, for example, um, without going through the mutual legal assistance process, and that's a long, laborious process. And on top of that, um, the US government insists, ultimately, that a US prosecutor gets a US warrant according to US legal standards, a probable cause standard in terms of the, the standard for, for accessing the data, but also incorporates a number of other US standards, including the First Amendment free speech standards of the United States, which are, as everyone here knows, not the same as free speech standards elsewhere. And so that has caused an enormous amount of frustration for foreign governments, and so one piece of the Cloud Act authorizes the US government to enter into executive agreements with foreign partners in order to lift that blocking statute, as Bertrand said, and enable those foreign partners to make direct requests to US-based providers. Um, this part of the legislation um, includes a number mm. of criteria um, that the foreign partner has to meet. So in, before an agreement can even be entered into, the partner has to be certified by the US as being rule of law and human rights compliance, and then each and every request has to meet a number of specified standards, including it has to be targeted, subject to some sort of review or oversight. It has to um, basically protect free speech principles, although it doesn't insist exactly on the US First Amendment standards, so that does allow for some more flexibility than currently exists in the law, and a whole host of other requirements. Um, 
It ref and, and importantly, and this goes back to the, to the question of, of how do you draft these kinds of agreements that protect sovereign interests, it only authorizes foreign governments to make these direct requests for, for data of foreigners outside the United States if the foreign partner is going to request the data of a U.S. citizen or a U.S. resident, it continues to need to apply through the mutual legal assistance process based on the theory that U.S. interests are tied to, in this respect, are tied to its citizens and residents, and that U.S. standards and U.S. rules should apply to the gathering of data of U.S. residents. And these agreements have to be reciprocal, so the same limitation would apply if the U.S. government, for example, entered into an agreement with Brazil, then the U.S. government could not use this agreement to make direct requests for Brazilian residents and Brazilian citizens data would have to use the mutual legal assistance process, again reflecting the idea that Brazil should set the standards for access to its own residents and its own citizens data. That's part two. The part of the Cloud Act that's probably been the most controversial here in Europe and elsewhere around the world is, the, is what I call the first part of the Cloud Act, which is a response to um, a lawsuit that was brought by Microsoft or a, a, not a lawsuit, but a, a refusal to, a, a motion to quash a warrant that was issued by the U.S. government. Um, and Microsoft moved to quash the warrant on the grounds that the U.S. government um, was seeking data pursuant to a warrant issued by a judge based on the standard of probable cause from Microsoft, but that the data that the U.S. government sought happened to be stored in Ireland. And Microsoft said, your warrant authority doesn't extend to data that's outside the territorial boundaries of the United States. Um, the dispute went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, as the Supreme, after there were arguments before the Supreme Court, before the Supreme Court could issue its ruling, the US Congress stepped in and, and passed the Cloud Act. And the Cloud Act clarifies, consistent with the US government's position, that the location of data does not delimit access. So if the US government goes to a court and gets a warrant based on probable cause in a criminal investigation, to be clear, we're talking about criminal investigations, not national security investigations, and issues that warrant on a US-based service provider or another service provider over which it has jurisdiction, that provider is obliged to turn over the data within its possession, custody, or control, regardless of where the data happens to be located. And so, one thing that I think is important to understand about this is this was the long-standing practice on the assumption of, I think, most parties in the system up until the point in time at which Microsoft issued this challenge. So it had always been the case, at least in the context of another form of compelled disclosure orders in the United States subpoenas, that when the US government issued subpoenas on companies, those companies were required to turn over responsive material in their possession, custody, or control without regard to location. Another piece of this is, again, to remember that at least when we're talking about content, there's an obligation to get a warrant, which requires review by an independent judge that, in fact, there is a predicate criminal investigation, that the evidence, that there's probable cause to believe that the evidence is necessary for that investigation, and that the request is particularized and targeted in accordance with US law requirements. Um, and then um, one, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll stop. Oh, one last piece that I, that's worth emphasizing about that first part of the Cloud Act is that it also incorporates new provisions that hadn't formally been in place in U.S. law that explicitly provides a mechanism for providers to move to quash if the U.S. government is seeking the data of a foreigner outside the United States and if the request creates a conflict with US law. And there's two separate ways that, that providers can do that. One is via this new mechanism that was created by the Cloud Act, although it only can be triggered in very limited and currently non-existent situations, but also by explicitly emphasizing the availability of what's known as common law comedy claims. And again, to just hammer home um, the point that this again reflects this idea that um, foreign governments should and do have a say in how other governments, including the U.S. government, access the data of their own citizens and residents. But it doesn't make sense for, say, Ireland's laws to restrict the U.S. government when it's trying to access 
the data of its own citizens, its own residents, and in the investigation of local crime just because the data happens to be stored in Ireland. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, Fernanda, maybe you wanted to, to react to this. Yes, uh, uh, I want to make a comment. Uh, I think, uh, well, the question here is that the approach of United States is that they have jurisdiction over uh, the data, the companies, uh, ha if the companies have their headquarters there, if they are American companies. And what Brazil's legislation and even evidence proposals uh, tell about that jurisdiction uh, exists if the services are being provided in the territory. So uh, the thread of thought is that if a company is doing business in my country, it has to follow my laws. And also, um, if a crime is being committed in my territory by a citizen of my country, um, I mean, nothing is about, uh, is, is foreign there. Only the data that we don't know where it is. Uh, we have to be able to, uh, to make this law to be complied by the companies. And when it comes to the, for instance, incitement to racism, which is a very, uh, very important thing in Brazil, or denial of Holocaust that was already judged also in our Supreme Court. Uh, if I had crimes like that, and if I needed content from a company in the United States, I wouldn't get it even via MLA. And I don't think the cloud that is going to solve it. That's, I don't know, we'll have to address it some, some, uh, sometime, I don't know. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, so I think, so, so a couple of things. One, um, as Bertrana also pointed out, there's only been one executive agreement under the Cloud Act so far. The Cloud Act was enacted 18 months ago. We've seen one executive agreement. And um, there's some discussions that there's negotiations with Australia as well. Um, but this is, as Bertrand mentioned, a slow process and not something that's likely to solve all of the problems immediately. Um, the second part of the Cloud Act, pursuant to which executive agreements could be entered into, is meant to deal with exactly precisely the problems that you've identified, um, whether um, it's the right or sufficiently, uh, whether it's gonna be effective and, and to what extent and how many countries ultimately enter into these agreements and get the kind of access that, that's being discussed here is I think an open question. So it's a limited solution for now. Yeah. Great, but thank you very much. Um, I think we can proceed like with questions from, uh, from the audience here, but also online, Rachel, please. Uh, wave a hand if you have anything um, uh, coming from the audience and we'll, we'll take the questions. Um, just um, before we start, a um, couple of things. Uh, Jennifer uh, has to take a flight uh, rather early, so may need to leave um, five or ten minutes before the Q&A session ends. So please bear that in mind. And as you ask the questions, please introduce yourself, um, your name and the organization you represent. Thank you. Are there any questions? Please, the lady at the back there. Sorry. There, there, there. Just under the mic. Right, okay, sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Parsa Sajid, and uh, I teach at a university in Bangladesh, and uh, the question I have in discussions uh, here, the, I mean, Multiple uh, panelists raise, you know, talks about the criminal justice system and, you know, the specific criminal acts as if it's, you know, neutral and specific. But the problem with, you know, criminalization and criminal justice system is not uh, neutral. So, for example, when you're talking about kind of data sharing for specific uh, criminal acts or criminal, you know, criminal activity, uh, what is your reaction kind of when uh, governments, you know, go towards like large scale criminalization of activities like, you know, sex workers, uh, drug use, and that does not kind of, that actually ends up uh, negatively affecting, you know, large, 
uh, sections of society who are already marginalized, and in these kind of discussions, they actually have no participation. So all these kind of you know, uh, criminalization, criminal justice processes, there is no representation or very little representation of uh, people who are being criminalized. Thank you. Anybody want to take that question first? <laughs> okay, I'll, uh, okay. I'll, the, the, point is, the point is that uh, there is globally some sort of consensus of what is to be criminalized. And that would reflect more or less the Articles 2 to uh, 11 of the Budapest Convention in terms of cybercrime. Uh, there is a lot of disagreement for many other things. There is a big risk that we also see that countries adopt domestic substantive criminal law, meaning criminalizing conduct in a very broad way that would leave uh, a lot of room for, for interpretation that is unclear, that it has no, no, no clear limits. And that, is, that leads then to cyber, cyber crime investigations and prosecutions for free speech, for sex work, and, 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 and so on. When it comes to the international cooperation part of that, the dual criminality provisions usually kick in, including in, in the forms of, of direct disclosure that we have, uh, that we published a few weeks ago. And there you would not get cooperation from another country, for example, on, on pornography in general. Many countries do not criminalize pornogra pornography in general, they, they criminalize child pornography or child abuse materials, right? So you get cooperation on child abuse materials online, but in many cases you do not get cooperation on forms that are not criminalized in both countries. But again, that does not help you nationally in, in your, in your, um, in, in your, uh... Sorry, yeah. Mike, Sorry, Mike, so Mike, just Mike, one Mike. second. You so that the online audience can also hear you. I mean, I would have to disagree that there is broad consensus globally of what should be criminal and criminalized behavior. I mean, that is part of the problem, that people who are being criminalized generally are not part of these discussions. For example, sex workers, right? So I, 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 would, I would, again, strongly disagree with that contention no. that no, there I is broad say. agreement. Sorry, I didn't say that. I said there is a number, there is a range of offenses that are broadly agreed upon, and they would, one second, there is a, a hundred plus countries that have implemented, whether they are parties to the Budapest Convention or not, they've implemented Article 2 to 11, illegal access, state of system interference, and so on, including what is called in the treaty child, child pornography. That is, there is agreement on that. For anything else, there is not necessarily agreement. And there's no, certainly no agreement on, and if you want to kill any discussion about something you talk about, legalizing or criminalizing prostitution, you know, then immediately you kill, you have disagreement and you will not go ahead. There's no agreement on that. That's why you don't find an international treaty, multilateral treaty, which talks about criminalizing uh, sex work or uh, prostitution or whatever, right? That's what I said. So I didn't say that there is agreement on that. I think, yeah, Bertrand, just one second. I think this, this points to the, the, perhaps the discussion of, uh, around precisely that effort, the UN effort to get some sort of uh, um, uh, general consensus. I mean, over the past decades, uh, there hasn't been any consensus at UN level. And probably the definition of crimes is probably one stumbling block. And, and I think bit by bit, um, uh, moving forward, the international community can slowly build um, uh, a framework that, that can work. But Bertrand, do you have anything yeah, to add? I, I would like actually to, to um, intervene in that, in that regard because as was said in the presentations before, we're not only talking about cyber crime, but we're talking about also a lot of criminal investigations that increasingly require um, access to electronic evidence. And so, in as much as there is a relative convergence on the definitions of cybercrime in the context of uh, the Budapest Convention, for instance, of course, there's an enormous disparity on what is criminalized in one country or the other. 
I want to highlight that one of the things that needs to be done in those, in those debates, and that's one of the real focus of what we're trying to accomplish, is to allow the different actors to formulate the problem in a way that is a common formulation. And I think what we are all trying to do, and when I say all, it is the law enforcement, the different parts of governments, uh, the companies, the civil society actors, international organizations. What is at stake is what are the substantive and procedural guarantees under which a regime or regimes in plural would allow law enforcement or investigators in one country to request directly from a foreign operator information about a user. And this notion of procedural and substantive guarantees goes directly into your, your direction because one of the fundamental stumbling block and difficult thing is do you accredit one country's legal system or not, which is a little bit what the Cloud Act intends to do, do you evaluate each request case by case? Do you accredit a cooperation mechanism between two countries on some topics of criminality? Do you use the approach that the um, European Union uh, e-evidence regulation envisages, which is to set a certain bar of um, penalties and saying only serious crimes of more than three years, and actually when it is now in front of Parliament, the European Parliament says the bar at three years is too, too low, it should be five years. So how the nuances of those things can be taken into account so that the regimes can be efficient and at the same time not cover absolutely any crime is one of the big challenges um, under consideration uh, today. And I want just to highlight that in one of the other groups that we facilitate, there is a distinction that is emerging, which is the notion of international normative consistency. And in very rapidly, you have things where everybody agrees are either behavior or content that is inappropriate and the standards are relatively uniform. Others where everybody, they have to be addressed, but the standards vary. And other situations where there's disagreement among the countries on whether something should be criminalized or not. And the challenge in building those regimes is to take into account this diversity so that the protections are guaranteed and at the same time, the um, the uh, system is efficient. But of course, it cannot address in an international regime the challenge that you're addressing in a certain way, which is the participation of the people in the national legislation that might impact them. That's another issue that cannot be solved at the international level, and I think you have a point. Lumila, you wanted to raise a point. Maybe also to your question, I, I think we all agree there is no uh, kind of a definition of criminal offenses, and I think this is kind of our probably, but as Bernard said, it's about also about procedural and um, substantial safeguards which we need in place when it comes to e-evidence. But we also face also within the European Union different notions of what, if, what is a crime and not a crime. So I think the kind of what we are also in favor is to say a kind of a common notions, definitions of what is supposed to be part of the evidence proposal would be useful exactly for this because honestly I don't think that anybody wants that the provider to be the judge of what is a crime or not. So I think this is a point where we kind of are, um, there is um, a kind of the, the, the question of safeguards in place in order to balance case by case, but also the question of some legal framework that allows everybody to decide and to say, okay, this is it, and I can just, at least this um, request uh, response to this crime, this is uh, the framework, these are the safeguards, okay, and I can, we, we can then disclose, because to disclose the data, once again, this is what we're trying to emphasize, is it's about law enforcement, but it's also about disclosing data, uh, a user's data, which could be, in some cases, very, very, tricky, especially when it comes to journalists or protected groups. So I think this is uh, the question where uh, on cyber, so I agree with Bernard, it's about procedural stuff, but also kind of the notion of what, could, what is um, respect. And that's why international agreements are so useful because they tackle exactly this kind of an issue and then they can agree on uh, specific definitions or notions. Thank you. Uh, just one thing, uh, if you wish to ask questions, please proceed to either of the mics uh, on each side of, of the room, please. Um, I see people already queuing, so please go ahead with the questions, uh, the lady with the striped shirt. Thank you. 
Thank you. That was a very interesting and enlightening panel, so thank you for that. Um, my name is Marile Maciel. I am from Diplo Foundation. And uh, several speakers highlighted the fact that it's really important to have the right safeguards in place when we're talking about enacting regulation to have access to users' information. Um, there is a directive uh, that is uh, approved but not, has not been transcribed into national laws on the protection of personal data in the context of investigations in Europe. If I'm not mistaken, the Commission has referred Greece and Spain to the court for not transpo transposing this directive. So could you, could you shed some light on the importance of this directive and how it fits into the debate of what you're talking about? And just a quick question to, to Jennifer. Um, what I understand from what Fernanda said is that from the standpoint of a government that feels that they have jurisdiction over uh, a case, a criminal case in the first place, it feels like a quick fix um, to have in the Cloud Act provisions that will make the US government be in the position to judge if the country should have access to that information or not. So even though this could be a partial solution to the problem, would that be a political solution to the problem in the long run? Because I am afraid that many countries will not be judged to be reliable enough to have access to that information under the, the Cloud Act. Thank you. Jennifer, maybe you want to start? Sure. So, so just as, um, as, as background, the Cloud Act is meant to alleviate, not exacerbate, the situation that we're faced in, which is exactly what was presented, is that there are times in which um, two countries um, claim um, different jurisdiction in some sense or at some sense or another over the same company. So Brazil may say, um, Google is offering services in my country and therefore is subject to my law, which I agree is a completely legitimate exercise of jurisdiction, um, depending on the circumstances. And, and, and Brazil may say, under my law, Google has to turn over a certain amount of communications content. Google, that is also subject to US law, is prohibited under US law from turning over that communications content, not based on the Cloud Act, based on an old 1980s act that was enacted before there was an internet and before anybody was, there, there was an internet, before there was, a, there was a cloud and anybody was thinking about these types of, of issues. Um, and so the Cloud Act is meant in certain circumstances to alleviate that, to lift the blocking statute so that Google or any other company could turn over that data without violating US law. Um, the problem facing many countries is that the mechanism for lifting that blocking statute is relatively limited and only kicks in after a case-by-case -case assessment of the country and the entering into these executive agreements of which there's none that are yet implemented. There's one that's been drafted and now there's a 180-day waiting period in Congress. Okay. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yes. I want to talk about the police directive. Okay? Please go ahead, yes. Second part. I believe you were referring to the police directive of EU. Um, what I can say from the perspective of Brazil, uh, besides the safeguards, I have already told that all data is disclosed only with uh, judicial order, and it also uh, everything that is collected in the investigation is disclosed and can be challenged in court and also can be redressed in, if there has been any abuse. And in Brazil, we, are, uh, we, we, have, um, we have a law that is already passed, but it's not in force uh, yet, which is the data protection law, uh, very similar to the GDPR. And there's an article there that refers to all data that has to be regulated um, for investigation and security, uh, and we'll have to, to, to write uh, something like this uh, police directive. That's what I, I can add to, to the panel here. Uh, Ludmila, 
Okay. Yeah, maybe just a bit of, of my uh, previous life when I was on the lawmaker side. Um, basically, the GDPR and the Police and Justice Directive are one complex. So the GDPR is the broader one for everyone, and the Police and Justice Directive is the one to for personal data for law enforcement authorities in a broader sense. But the Police and Justice Directive is meant to be actually uh, to um, for processing data for purposes of investigating, deterring, protecting crime, and so on. But it's basically a very uh, it's meant to be interpreted very, very um, um, narrow, so that uh, um, only specific types of crimes and law enforcement but, or authorities with this kind of purposes under the directive um, have this a bit more privileged regime. Otherwise, it's GDPR to apply for everybody. And the transposition uh, um, framework of time, timeline passed, and uh, some countries didn't uh, implement it uh, on time. That's why the Commission is going uh, uh, for after these countries. So this is for the explanation. I hope that explains a bit. Um, on the question of jurisdiction, I think that the kind of where it's a very, of course, for us, uh, it, we've been referring all the time here. Um, it's kind of where I think the Budapest Convention, the Article 18, has a very good notion of jurisdiction when it comes not only about, and we agree that, that the localization of data is actually not the one we should refer to, but the Article 18 of the Budapest Convention is something that um, uh, have set out several requirements, um, for example, the control powers and controls. I think this is a very important element because uh, it's not like Google everywhere has the data. Um, every co entity of Google has access to all the data which are required. And I, honestly, I don't want to have, uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a such a very sensitive issue where a specific team is trained to deal with all these requests. And that's why not all of our entities are able to do this or we don't want them to do this because um, this is a very, very specific and sensitive issue, which we want to have all only trained people to deal with it. I hope that gives a bit of our um, a bit of our um, enlightenment. As I said, Budapest Convention Article 18. We also think that the e-evidence regulation should follow this um, um, this provision. Thank you. I actually, I wanted to mention something else, but I'm very happy that you like Article 18 in the interpretation of the guidance note that we adopted about two years ago. I think that's a very important uh, concept. But just on data protection, it's extremely important and extremely complicated. And it's, what adds to the complication is that, that we talk here about asymmetric type of cooperation, where law enforcement of one country sends a request to a service provider in another country, and this, this request already contains personal data. And if the service provider responds to that, again, personal data is transmitted. And how do we sort this out? The data protection provision in the protocol to the Budapest Convention is probably the most complicated one to negotiate. It's very, very hard, but we're making good progress there, and hopefully, in January or February, we have a draft provision, and then maybe we can also go out and have some consulta more consultation uh, with data protection experts on that. So it's the EU directive on data protection, the GDPR, is very important, but we will try to build specific data protection requirements into the protocol itself. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, do we have any questions from the online audience? Okay, great, fantastic. And we can proceed with the Hi. following question from the audience. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elisabetta Fierro, and uh, I'm a member of uh, some nonprofit organization and trying to cooperate to reduce uh, existential risks and enhance uh, so, um, inclusion, governance inclusion, reduce inequalities and mitigate the risks. Uh, so. Uh, abuses of uh, violence and abuses. Uh, I would like to ask, um, so what about uh, information governance? Uh, because of course there are uh, different kind of access to information for different reasons, sometimes also because of security or because of uh, interests. What happens if, if uh, institutions uh, are abusing their powers uh, against citizens? Uh, for example, what about targeting campaigns? Uh, what is possible to do to declare these abuses and get uh, access to justice, to information, and uh, dignity? Uh, so it's incredible what uh, we have achieved uh, with the research. We have mind control technologies. Uh, um, uh, so uh, an incredible uh, amount of uh, 
uh, so advanced technologies, but the, what about ethics uh, and the use of it? Uh, why uh, there's uh, um, lack of information? Uh, and uh, so uh, what happens if uh, technology is uh, used to repress uh, uh, like civil freedom? Uh, or uh, to manipulate uh, human behavior? What about identity? Um, what happens uh, with human dignity? What is identity now? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so if I were to rephrase the question very shortly, it's um, uh, uh, to what extent the solution, or what we've been discussing, are providing some kind of procedural or substantive safeguards to prevent states from abusing their investigative powers, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in states where the rule of law may not be um, um, something um, that they particularly follow. <laughs> they have their own system of, <laughs> of law. Um, is there you, maybe a very short response from me and maybe others who want to take it up, but in 2008 there was an important decision of the European Court of Human Rights. It was in December 2008. It's a case of KU versus Finland. It's about the human dignity. It's about the dignity of a 12-year-old boy from Finland and on a social dating website, his details, his, his, his picture, his telephone number and so on, were, were posted with him offering sexual services. And at that time, the laws protecting privacy in Finland were so strong that the service provider, under no circumstances, was permitted to disclose who posted this, right? The laws was an absolute prohibition of that. And this went through the courts in, in, in Finland and then ended up at the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And the Court of Human Rights made a remarkable decision saying that Finland was responsible for not putting the laws in place to protect the dignity of this boy, in this case. And that governments have the obligation, the positive obligation, to protect individuals that are victims of crime, also through criminal law, including Article 18 of the Budapest Convention, which is specifically mentioned in that, in that decision, by the way. So we have to look at it also from that angle that if we have 100,000 cyber crimes and quite a number of them violating the dignity of individuals and only 0.01% of them are prosecuted. We have a failure of protection of dignity. Just to give you one, one comment, it's getting longer and longer, my answer here. Um, we had last week in the Octopus Conference, we had people from the prosecution office of Buenos Aires. That office receives every month, on average this year, the first 10 months, they received 30,000, that makes 3,000 pieces of information from uh, internet sender for mis missing and exploited children. The 3,000 IP addresses that point at child abuse materials being disseminated, downloaded, shared, and so on. That's just that office per month. And the, and the, uh, and the difficulty to then go and get, find out who are the subscribers, are enormous. That's also we have to keep in mind if we talk about human dignity. So, to protect the human dignity of, of lots of children whose pictures are being uh, uh, exploited and they are being exploited and being shared, that's also protecting human dignity. Thank you. Well, I think we can proceed to the next question. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jonas Kreitz. I work for the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. And uh, my colleagues from law enforcement also say that uh, the issue is growing day by day and uh, it's getting more important, more and more important to combat uh, serious crime and also organized crime. So my question is more of a strategic uh, nature. Um, we are obviously members of the Budapest uh, Convention and we would like uh, all the world to join, but uh, as you as of, or have also discussed, uh, we see uh, at the global level, the, 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 the resolution of the third committee uh, of the UN, and where also some countries that 
have considered joining the, the Budapest Conventions are, are co-signatories of this, um, or co-sponsors of this uh, resolution. Um, so where do you see this going at a global level? Uh, do, we, do we have some elements for, for agreement uh, uh, on combating cybercrime, on, on, on uh, uh, digital evidence uh, globally, or, or do you rather see what, what was mentioned also in the beginning, uh, kind of a schism uh, appearing uh, globally in, 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 with regard to this um, question. Um, so thanks uh, uh, for, for, for giving us a bit of, of, of your vision uh, where, where we are moving globally. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we can also take the next question and then we'll, we'll address them uh, at the same time. I am Madan Obroy from Interpol. Uh, my question is specifically directed to uh, Alexander and Bertrand. And, uh, and it is in context of what Alexander mentioned about 0.01% as the consequences being brought on. From the context of, uh, or the perspective of uh, uh, internet user, especially who's a victim of crime, or a perspective of a law enforcement personnel, how do you see, or how optimistic you are in terms of a global arrangement or agreement for combating cybercrime, whether it is Budapest Convention or the UN Convention, if it ever comes, or a, a, a matrix of different interoperable uh, agreements which can take care of uh, bringing consequences to all cyber criminals. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody wants to volunteer first? Yeah, maybe I'll start okay. uh, very briefly. There is no single treaty that can solve all the problems. That's, that's absolutely clear. We have to, I mean, that would be uh, completely surrealistic. I think we need a matrix. We need a matrix of, of multiple solutions that includes what, what Interpol already has, and that's why we're also happy to have a, a partnership with, with Interpol. It includes what many other organizations are doing. But what I'm afraid of, and what I see, is that the criminal justice response which is a very protective response, right? Because it protects the rights of individuals. That's what criminal procedure law is about. It empowers, but empowers law enforcement to do something with conditions. And then there are remedies, and this can be challenged in court. So the criminal justice response is a very protective response. The debt response is completely sidelined. And we have to make it more effective and not leave it only to the national security arena where these protections are not necessarily there, where there is a strong interest in protecting critical infrastructure, but where the, the interests and the rights of victims are sort of also sidelined. This is coming to that question. Regarding the, the question on the UN General Assembly, how this is going, at the moment, the risk of polarization of fascism is really there. And it's not something we now make up. We have this experience of the 2012 international telecom regulations. The big question is, do countries that are opposing that resolution for exactly this reason and, and some other reasons, should they engage or should they stay out? That, that is an open question. There's no answer to that. It was uh, heavily discussed last week in, in connection with the Octopus Conference. There's an interesting video of a presentation by a representative of the Russian Federation and, and then some responses to that. Um, but it's an open question whether to engage or not engage. Uh, in principle, I think one should engage, but it depends, of course, also the conditions. If everybody's taken for a ride and there's a pre-cooked uh, decision already, then there's no reason to legitimate something through engagement. So we have to, this has to be evaluated by governments from around the world very carefully. Certainly not up to me to decide. Jennifer, please go ahead. Yeah, so on the, on two, two just quick thoughts on the question of are we headed towards a schism? And um, one, just to build off on, on what was just said, to the extent that we're, we're building data regimes that facilitate law enforcement access to data, it is, as I think we've all highlighted, important for those regimes to include accountability provisions and substantive and procedural safeguards. And I think we need to be wary of initiatives that don't include that as one of their primary key elements. Um, secondly, on the schism piece, I think we are headed towards a schism. And I think we're headed towards a schism in part because 
at the same time that the initiatives that we've highlighted here with respect to e-evidence to some extent the Cloud Act and certainly the Budapest Convention negotiations are all geared at um, facilitating cross-border access to data in a world in which the parties acknowledge and accept that data moves around with relative ease and that the sovereign interests at stake are not necessarily linked to the location of the data. There is a very different approach, a data sovereigntist approach, and people use that word in all different ways, but a data sovereigntist approach that I would link to some of Russia's initiatives and China's initiatives in which the territorial data sovereign link is very intact and there's a real concern about any efforts to try to um, access data across borders and more importantly, a real move towards data localization as a means of securing and ensuring control. And to the extent that we have, um, those, those two visions are just not consistent. And so um, unless we figure out a way to kind of mediate those two visions, I think we increasingly get into a world in which we have competing systems to some extent. Thank you, Bertrand, very, very shortly. Yeah. Uh, as Madden uh, has said, it, it triggers the reaction. Somebody in my, in my team said, uh, the challenge is both to bring people to justice and to bring justice to people. So integrating the notion of the user and how the rights are protected is a very important uh, element. And I want to highlight as, as a sort of conclusion that time is of the essence. We're under pressure at the moment because of the scale of the problem that is growing and that has been repeatedly uh, mention. This requires technical, um, not automation, but streamlining, engineering of the relationships, but it requires frameworks. We absolutely need frameworks. And if we don't, a certain number of consequences. One, there will be a continuation of things that are without guarantee. And the companies will be under pressure. They will have to accept the requests without any framework that is really clear and guarantees the right to appeal and so on. Second, as Jennifer mentioned, as long as we do not have a framework that establishes clearly the conditions under which a country can conduct investigations and access information that is held by another company outside of their frontiers, the pressure rightly or wrongly can be an alibi to invoke data localization will be strong and will remain strong. And vice versa, the other side of the same coin is that the countries that have the power will exercise increasingly extraterritorial uh, authority. And when you think about data localization and extraterritoriality, this is not the way we are thinking about sovereignty in a classical way. And the challenge is how do we define sovereignty in a digital age and how does it really uh, function? And I want to highlight one thing, which is that the current international system based on territorial jurisdictions is actually what prevents cooperation on those issues. It is what is hindering the capacity of the actors to work together. And even if the time pressure is important, I take as a positive sign the fact that there is strong awareness, and I would echo what Alexander was, uh, was saying at the beginning. There is progress. It's not as quick as it should be, but there is progress. And I would like to quote one of my favorite philosophers, which says, uh, pessimism is a matter of mood, and optimism is a matter of will. We need to solve those issues. And honestly, the framing components are there. But there is a need to go forward. And if there is not enough desire to solve the, solution, the, the, the problem, we can get into a protracted battle for five or 10 years with two camps fighting against one another. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I think that, Jennifer, did you want to say? Okay, uh, that concludes uh, this workshop. I think just to, to uh, Bertrand's, uh, did you want to say something? Okay, um, to, uh, just to go back to Bertrand's uh, point, I think this, um, this is, uh, this basically, this is quoting the motto of the IGF, which is about one world, uh, one net, and one vision. Uh, and it's about building that um, block by block. And it takes time, but we need to do it. Um, I, I think next year we'll have, again, plenty to talk about. So uh, I thank the, uh, all the panelists. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to the audience. Thank you to the online audience. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next year.